my talk is the strange one about dusty plasma processes. Uh, maybe you never heard the strange set of words what are dusty plasmas. Plasma physics is, of course, the collective behavior of electrons and ions. And it has this beautiful name, dusty plasma, if yet another charge carrier is there. It's called dust, macroscopic. And its charges can continuously, or almost continuously, change in time, as opposed to electrons and ions. So, and of course, airless bodies, in this case, objects without a global magnetic field, actually, we do have airless objects with global magnetic fields like Mercury, but certainly there is no global atmosphere in this talk just yet. And then, uh, on the left is how people imagine an object like that, what is the environment of such an object in space? And that's from the late 60s, early 70s, and this is more recent, that's the moon. And these arrows at the time, you already knew about the solar wind, high speed electrons and ions flowing away from the sun, about 400 kilometers per second. They interact with the object, they charge. Turns out that the temperature of the plasma is about 10 electron volts. You don't have to remember the number, but you have to remember one fact. That temperature for the electrons is so high that they couldn't care less about the global motion of the solar wind. Electrons are at all places at all times. For ions, the ion speed actually is less than the flow speed. Ions make a wave. Yeah. The ion flow is supersonic. There is no information propagating back that there is an obstacle coming. So people are thinking about the when we are big. And then when the solar wind comes in, the surface charging and all kinds of issues was known. And maybe the first thing you notice from the late 60s and 2010s, certainly the graphics improved quite a bit. <laughs> but there is also a lot more detail about what happens on the surface. We know a lot more about the sun, we know a lot more about the solar wind. And I will try to walk through a couple of the issues that you will face. Is a whole industry, there is a lot of interesting questions about the global environment, what happens with the solar wind, how you form the wind, how you fill in. But I would like to take the other extreme, what happens if you are on the surface? And this is a lander, I wish I could show you a lander with a different logo, but that's the best. <laughs> the best I have, this is the ESA lander, it has yet to be approved by the ministers of the various countries that contribute to ESA funding. And that's what they are thinking, and a lot of issues that they try to figure out. What happens if you live on the surface? The solar wind, the electrons and ions are coming, they will get to the surface, some of them get stuck there. The sun is shining, it will produce photons, will release electrons from the surface, that's a photoelectric effect. When you cast shadows, you can set up electric fields. Cosmic rays are coming with the high energy particles. And of course, micrometeorites are bombarding at all times. How you would live there? How you would make measurements in an environment like this? What are the right questions to ask? What exactly should you measure if you go there? How would you do that? How do you analyze your data? And that's what one node of the Lunar Science Institute does, CCL does, that's our job, is to figure out how to make the good measurements, what sort of instruments you should fly, and what sort of issues can you can you have. I, I want to start because I cannot resist, of course, this glorious image of a movie. That's Apollo 17. Every time it certainly brings tears to our eyes. I wish we could do this today, but we cannot. And certainly what you should remember, first of all, we've been there, we, we, we buggied around. It's an incredible achievement. But I would like to stop at the first opportunity if you are into education and kids getting excited, you could pause here for a second. And that is, take a look at these swirls of dust particles coming off from, from the wheels, those we call the rooster tails. And you could actually, it's a teaching moment because you can ask the kids what's happening. Why are those rooster tails evolving in time as they do? And it turns out that you could analyze these images, dance that high schoolers involved, you could lay down a coordinate system, you could try to follow the motion of the dust particle, you know the size of the wheel, you know the, the, the rotation rate of the wheel, you could actually figure out the motion of the dust cloud on the moon. Ballistic motion, 
physics 101. Yeah? You put them fits, parabolas, and you more or less establish the lunar gravity, and you would say, can I do this on Earth? Did they cheat? I said, well, let's try. What would happen if I do this on Earth? Number one, there is an atmosphere. If there is an atmosphere, there is drag. If you were to do this on this Earth, you will get a different shape of those parabolas. You cannot do this on Earth. <coughs> so that's a teaching moment. I would like to move on and just remind you that, yes, it's a glorious picture. It also shows you how difficult an environment it is. One of my colleagues had this expression, it's like working, working in a coal mine. And this is actually Apollo 15, the first EVA, the first time the astronaut went out. And notice he's pitch black to his knees. That's EVA number two. He's almost pitch black to his waist. And third time he is covered with dirt everywhere. It's a hearsay because I never find the official statement from NASA. The force of these was actually, we never executed four excursions in a row. After the third one, for example, I understand, certain after 15, the glove did not click in place anymore. It's hard. It's a hard place to be. It's a hard place to keep your machines alive, your optics alive. Anything you want to do there, it's not going to be easy. Sometimes, actually, it's really difficult. You must have seen this before. But what I would really like to tell you is there's a lot of interesting dust and plasma issues even before we go there, even before humans trample around and make a disaster out of the environment and stir up the dust. And there is plenty of evidence, and some of these issues we kind of left behind since Apollo. We never had the will or the guts or the, the knowledge how to resolve these problems. And I just list a couple. Before the Apollos, we had the surveyor series. Five, six, and seven. They were facing to the west. The sun set, it's behind the horizon. And then we have these hovering bright clouds appearing in the picture. Remind you, there are no winds. There are no winds on the surface of, of the moon. Ha, ha. And the best explanation of that is forward scattered light on dust clouds above the surface. How others you do that? What, why would dust come off the surface? What's going on? We had Apollo 17 left behind an experiment, the lunar ejector and meteorite experiment. It had three little sets of sensors, east, west, and up facing. And every time there was a sunrise or a sunset, the instrument went from lit to dark or dark to lit. The number of events it registered skyrocketed. Its reports, I was hit, I was hit. Only at sunrise and sunset, that makes no sense. So who cares? Why would anyone care about these issues? And of course, I, I argue that all of you or all of us should. There are certainly lunar science and engineering issues about the surface charging, the size and velocity distribution of moving particles, if they really do, what exactly do they do? Is there an appropriate time or a more suitable time, an optimum time for the astronauts to do whatever they want to do or make measurements that they want to do? It's important. I'm not really a planetary scientist, I have to fess up. So it, it's important to, to basic plasma physics. One of the first issues in plasma physics, plasma, when it started, long ago, sticking a wire into a plasma, that's only one set of measurements. The other is you have a surface in the plasma, and the plasma has to accommodate and charge the surface so that it will come into some sort of equilibrium of losses and sources in the plasma that's forming a sheet. That was long work, probably 1930s, and we still write paper about this. And now I have a beautiful laboratory. During the day, I build up a sheet. At night, I collapse it. I put a lot of dust in it. It's, it's an amazing laboratory. Let's go make measurements. And of course, all our planetary and astrophysical colleagues should, should care, because if this goes on on the moon, uh, why wouldn't it take place on asteroids or any other place where it's exposed to UV and plasma? on an asteroid, you will face the same problems there. So let me start 
it's something that perhaps most of you know about these swirls. These are albedo markings on the surface. And people argue that, you know, it has to do, these, these features come when there are local magnetic anomalies. The moon might have, in the past, a global magnetic field structure that is gone, but it still had, at places, reasonably strong, million Tesla sort of localized magnetic fields. And when the solar wind electrons and ions are coming, electrons and ions don't really pass by the magnetic field without noticing. They start moving around in various curved orbits. Their access to the surface might be different <coughs> than are magnetic fields. So people argue that it is actually space weathering. It's the effect of the solar wind reaching or not reaching of the surface in patches that makes these formulas. So, as a good physicist, the first thing I do is try to do this in the lab. I cannot possibly reproduce lunar conditions. I cannot possibly have a device that big magnetic fields and large turning motion of the orbits of the ions and electrons can be captured in the lab. I go to McGuckins, the local hardware store, and buy a much stronger magnet. I try to ask just the physics questions. Do you really do that? Do you really charge up the surface in a crazy way if you put plasma in, 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 in a magnetic field? And surprisingly, these issues were never addressed in the literature of plasma physics. Typically, we are worried about large-scale magnetic fields, but now, of course, the gyro radius, that's the turning curvature of an ion, is comparable to the, the, to the distance to the surface. It's a whole new set of plasma questions. So, and of course, I will make the plasma much more dense, so six will work out. In physics, we like to scale things. Yes, it does not reproduce the lunar conditions, but there's a lot you could learn in the little device in the laboratory. So, we have a piece of an isolating surface. We heat a little filament that will spray electrons in an argon gas. The electrons have enough energy that they will ionize the argon, and here you have a plasma measure the uh, ion energy distribution, you could make probe measurements, and you could kind of map out what happens near a magnetic field. And that's the plot. We measure the potential distribution. The potential has to do with the electric field. If you take the negative gradient, or just look at places where the colors change rapidly, that's a strong electric field. Here we are. We built up this crazy structure. And I notice that this is my dipole going and the dipole moment, the directionality of my magnet is this way, so these are the magnetic field lines. Ions are massive, and they roughly just go through the magnetic field. Electrons are kind of flighty. If you come far on this side, your turning motion has a large radius, and as you follow the field line, eventually you're going to hit the surface and get stuck there. If you are coming much closer, kind of tight because the field is stronger, and you are guided through what we call the, the strong magnetic fields intersect the surface. So we have these regions, and we have these strong electric fields that could build up underneath the magnet. And of course, if you orient the magnet in a different way, you get a different structure. So next, what we should do is sprinkle dust on the surface and see if we can rearrange it in some basic pattern. Stay tuned, we'll come back in a year, two years. Maybe by then I have the answer. The other driving piece of physics, of course, is radiation from the sun. And I'm sure many of you follow global change arguments. And oftentimes it's pointed out that, you know, the global energy output of the sun, from, sun, uh, from solar minimum to solar maximum, Change is only a minuscule amount, a fraction of a percentile. So it's very hard to kind of tie that into the whole energy input to the graph. But if you look at the part where actually not the whole, it's very little energy is coming, but at least those, the photons on that part, the very short wavelengths, photons, have enough energy to ionize. And that tiny fraction, what comes off from the sun, is changing a factor of several between solar wind and solar mass. The radiation that is responsible to maintaining an ionosphere or the lunar surface environment actually is changing a factor of several between solar wind and solar mass. Here it is. And of course then you could turn that, certainly in the lab, or you could actually uh, use solar uh, lunar samples and make these measurements. 
is the total current as function of the mean photon energy, and by the time you get to long towards uh, what's called the, the Lyman alpha edge, 10.2 electron volts times photons, there is a tremendous decrease in the production of uh, liberating electrons from the surface, and you can generate 5, 15, even 40 microamps per square meter. That's a quantity that you can easily measure on the surface or in the lab. Okay, can I do this in the lab? Okay. Can I do this kind of ultraviolet, shining ultraviolet light on the surface in the lab? And actually, it turns out that they are hard. Hard for silly reasons. One is that UV light sources are expensive. So if it's a little college experiment and I want five of those, you can easily blow 100K. So they are expensive. The other difficulty is it's very hard to shine light on the surface that you want to experiment with without shining light in all kinds of other surfaces. Every single emit photoelectrons. It's very hard to make a nice, tight, controlled experiment. But it is possible. So here it is. We're going to shine light. We set up grids. This is just to minimize the contributions to whatever we are measuring from the photoelectrons that are coming from the walls. We can shine light on zirconium or all kinds of other things, eventually lunar soil. But we started with stuff that has it's called a very low work function, so they emit a lot of electrons. My life is easier to make measurements. Another good material to work with, actually, is it's called cerium oxide. And the interesting thing is you could get a sheet of it on the surface, or you can get it in powder. So you could repeat the measurement, same material, it's just to form the tube to get it either powder or a nice smooth surface. And this is my only kind of typical possible part, these weekly lines, I know they're kind of boring, but imagine you're gonna stick in a wire and you set up a biased voltage between the wire and the environment. <coughs> if you are largely negatively biased, all the ions will like to come to you. And then if you change that voltage towards uh, more positive, the ions will not come and the electrons will come. The photoelectrons that you are from the surface will come. These are the various experimental setups, and this is the absolute value of the current. Anyway, that's a typical weekly line that we produce in the lab. All you need to notice is that at the end of the day, you produce many more photoelectrons from the surface than if it's a, if it's a solid surface, than from powder. It's called saturation current, and the values from the solid surface are always much higher than the values from the So maybe the, the photoelectric sheets, the properties on the surface, depending where you are at, whether it's a fine dust environment or an environment without dust, you have to figure it out. Imagine a different experiment. This time, the stuff that I'm going to shine light on is the surface. And I can certainly measure up the electron density as a function of distance. If you are close to the surface, but the electrons are just leaving, they will fly out and then return eventually because they left behind a positive charge. It's like an atmosphere. The further away you go, the lesser the electron density. Another interesting thing is that I can push it back and forth and have a little dust shaker on top and let the dust particle force through. Very close to the surface or further away from the surface. And catch it at the bottom and measure its charge. If it comes close to the surface, it's going to go through the sea of electrons. Even though it is also emitting electrons, it's also exposed to UV, its own electron emission rate is nothing compared to the surface. If I move away from the surface, the surface starts losing out, and the particle is starting and keeps continuing emitting its own photoelectrons, and the charge is actually turning positive. So if you are close to the surface, you are negatively charged. If you are far away from the surface, you are positively charged. Now, let's add just one more piece of code to this. If you have a positively charged surface, you set up an electric field. The electric field is away from the surface. Let's imagine I'm going to turn this, actually, the next slide. I'm going to turn this experiment in 90 degrees. So there's an upward pointing electric field. If you are close to the surface, with negative charges, there is an instantaneous tendency to fall back down because the force is down. The charge times the electric field is the force. If the charge is negative and the electric field is up, 
kaboom, you fall down. If you somehow manage to go far away, far enough away, your charge is positive, the electric field is out, you can beat gravity. You could actually beat gravity. And we have done that in another experiment in the lab. That's a pizza tray in a plasma chamber. And those are little dancing dust particles in the laboratory. Notice that there is no one close to the surface. They are all dancing above a certain height. If they were to come closer, they would immediately fall down. The way we put them up there is a highly qualified hammer. We have a dusty tray. <laughs> we kick the tray, a whole bunch of dust flows up. Some of them get captured. And the dance in the sheath, beating gravity. And I am not sure this is exactly the physics that goes on, but it certainly reminds me of this observation that above the surface, there's this layer of dust that has a very fine bottom edge. Where is the surface? Okay, I, there is a version of this image when, we, when people splice together day, day images with night images, mm -hmm. so they can actually identify the rock that this image comes over. So this is about, they argue it's about a meter or so above the surface, which is roughly this scaling the, for the divides of the sheath thickness in the plasma, I think it's there. So you've proven there are aliens kicking pizza trays on the <laughs> Go ahead, well, go ahead, tweet that away. <laughs> yeah, let's ask the question a little bit more seriously. How are they launched? So, okay. We, we can, I mean, get to the discussion in a second. Yeah. They, are certainly, they are certainly launched in response to all the <coughs> incoming meteorites. That can, has, has to go on at all times at all places. Secondly, the ejecta. And we have done the following experiment in the lab. Set up lit dark regions and move it across surfaces. And the horizontal electric field typically is enough to break cohesion, get you moving a little bit, hopefully bump into a grain next to you, and launch up in here. Or not in here, but away from the surface. So is the situation that because you see this only at, at the terminator, right? You're seeing this at the terminator. I have observations only at the terminal. Okay. The geometry is appropriate. I cannot possibly tell you this is happening at all time at all places. Right. So I guess my question is, once you, because you're not having meteorites constantly to create, are you kind of carrying these along, along the terminator as, and, and so over time, dust gets migrated over great distances? Perhaps. It appears that dust is running away from the sunshine and possibly at least to the finest of the lunar finds. There is a global general transport of moving this stuff around and around the surface. And of course, it's global in the sense that yeah, they, they kind of follow the sunrise sunset terminator. Their range could be only a couple hundred meters, maybe just a few meters. Yeah. But in general, there is this kind of a mini sand dune that's propagated from like the wave. Yes, the wave. Yes. Is the surface negative on the moon and above it is positive? No, 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 no. So it, it turns out that at this preceded our purchase of the UV lights. So every sign is reversed. This was done in a plasma. So in this case, the surface was negative and the charges are negative if you're firing and there's an iron sheath. In reality, what I think will happen on, on the moon, of course, is the day sign is positively charged everywhere. The solar system UV winds against electron and ion collection from the solar wind. So the surface is positively charged. Every charge that is missing from the surface is in the electron cloud above it, and the grains themselves be positively charged above a characteristic distance, and then you will be in gravity. How does this vary with the local gravitational force? That is, if you take, you're talking about the moon as one-sixth of Earth's gravity. What happens on an asteroid different? Beautiful question. Uh, uh, Do you get more dust levitated? So easier to levitate? So here are the pieces. It's, it seems to be easier, but not so fast. So the pieces to get off the surface, and maybe get dancing on the surface, has to do with gravity. Has to do with the fact that you have to be charged. You have to have at least an electron charge, so anything electrostatic will even notice that you're there. It turns out that the surface charge density is incredibly low. 
Most dust particles on the surface have no charge. Some of them, a tiny fraction of them will have one charge. And it's probably proportional to their projected surface area. So you would like to be a big grain that is against gravity. So maybe there is an optimized good size. And the next set of issues, that is all right. Imagine you could get you going, but you have to get through the sheet. And if you are a big particle, A, you travel slow, and your charging time to get that electron away from you is very quick. You will never make it across, it. you fall down. So there's a lot of pieces to this. I, I cannot just tell you that it's certainly much easier than an asteroid. But certainly if an asteroid, for example, is a fast rotator, I imagine that these things will come much easier. And in a couple of slides, I will show you what I think might be the consequence of this type of a transport. In addition to gravity, of course, things are not always smooth like in the lab. There are craters. And I apologize to my friends in Battery Sciences. That's the crater. <laughs> <laughs> they could do better. And all, all I have done at this time is we fired up plasma simulation code. Electrons and ions are followed self consistently. The sun is shining, we are emitting photoelectrons. And I work out the potential distribution the electric field structure above the crater, and I can make a cross section and I can look into it when the sun is shining directly down. You could hardly notice, but there is something odd is going on at the edges. But in general, there is an upward pointing electric field exactly as we discussed. Imagine that this is on the moon or an asteroid, and you wait a little, and the sun is moving in the sky. All of a sudden, that's not local noon. The sun is shining at an angle. Now, part, if it's shining at an angle, part of the crater is in the dark. It will not emit photoelectrons. It will actually get all the electrons from the neighborhood. So there's a huge charge density distribution variation at the bottom of the crater. You could set up large electric fields next to the crater. And of course, it's going to be different as the day progressing. Now, if you look above, of course, you notice that the sun is shining with the, 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 the part of the crater that remains dark. Will, will certainly be noticed in the potential distribution at the bottom of the crater. So you say a large potential. Well, I mean, is it large enough to be dangerous? Okay, so we can get to that. In the lab, we can easily do a couple, maybe even a volt, a volt and a half, over a millimeter distance in these experiments. That's a kilovolt per meter. That's kind of, that's healthy. That's a healthy electric field. It will not zip. Okay. The astronauts are fine. They can walk <laughs> through shadows. Me, since the 70s, of course, on electronics is a hell of a lot different. Much smaller, much better, much more sensitive, much more susceptible to electrostatic discharges. Remember, certainly in Boulder, you would notice it. And, and you go home, you wiggle around on your carpet, you touch the, the knob on the door, and you would say, ouch. You'll be all right. But if you carry the computer in your hand, it is toast. Would, would this be similar to the back of the dust bowl back yes. in America when it would be so you, you would just literally touch something like <coughs> a dust storm and yes. it would be able to just We could build an experiment if you have a size distribution of the dust and wind driven separation. First of all, where dust particles collide, they exchange charges. Tiny grains like to steal electrons from the big ones. Tiny grains are also the ones that are entrained in the wind easily. So you move away one type of charge to another. You set up an electric field. You reach the breakdown potential, and there is going to be a human gas discharge. You, you must have seen these beautiful images when last summer the volcano went on off in Iceland. And the night images were little beautiful discharges. That's the physics. OK, so and of course, we are excited. One day, we got a spacecraft next to you. It's just like that's my crater at the moment. The box is my spacecraft. So we can emit photoelectrons from the top of the spacecraft. And you could wait a little bit and notice that the spacecraft has to do something how it is own shadow propagating into the valley. Which is, if nothing else, one message. If you want to measure something, make sure that you not measure something that you create. It's hard to make measurements on a spacecraft. You have to get away from yourself because you are disturbing the environment. It's not one to many things, but there is some. It's, it's 
hard to be there without making a difference and you want to do the right measurement, you have to be mindful that the environment is sensitive, that you are also absorbing and releasing charges. So imagine then we do nothing else, I'm going to either from ejecta or whatever unknown reason, I imagine my dust particles are leaving the surface, some of them will immediately fall down, some of them will be maybe trapped in this sheath and make the, the glow, the, the lunar horizon glow. I didn't put on the ones that would be fast enough that they just totally escape or go to high or high levels. I want to concentrate for a second the ones that are launched and fall back. Launched and fall back. Launched and fall back at all times. Here is one example of being launched and fall back. Oh, it's a bit of sluggish, but here is a particle and it's kind of doing its thing. Eventually it's going to fall down on the surface. This is F equals MA, we follow the trajectory, we follow the charge as it changes in time, it's because of your motion up and down the sheath. So we can do this reasonably well, what the particle will do. What's the call? H. Eventually this particle will land on the surface. Oops, that's not what I had in mind. So, Imagine I'm going to do this over and over and over on my computer. That's the crater. It's only like a seven meter diameter crater. The black line, how I started, I distribute my dust particles. They are a tenth of a micron to one micron size particles. And nicely and flatly distributed. I let the sun go over once, overhead. And I notice that the distribution is changing. I do it for 15 days. I notice that the distribution is changing. My tiny little dust particles are falling into the bottom of the crater and they stay there. It's easier to get in than to get out. It's a center. So you got lucky. Being uniformly distributed is silly. Try something else. Every physicist, how sensitive your answer is your initial conditions. Did you get lucky or can you do something else? Let's pile up all the dirt on one side. Repeat the experiment. Soon enough, all the little dust particles will find their way to the bottom of the tree. So that's might or might not do with anything with nature. This came, of course, in science just a couple of weeks ago, Maria Zuber, Shackleton crater on the South Polar region, that's the topography, and all these other fancy plots for friends who do uh, geodesy would, would, would produce. She also noticed that. It's when I'm looking for volatiles, region that would reflect a lot of UV light. So it appears that the, the, the sides of my crater is much brighter than the bottom. She came to the conclusion for magic or big slides or for whatever reason, there is more volatiles on the side of the crater than at the bottom. I think it's just fine dust is being accumulating at the bottom of the crater. And actually we have seen these sort of things like on um, Eros, this is the one we look at the near satellite kind of landed in 2001. And then we see these regions that appear to be very smooth. And I will come back to that in the next slide. Why do you say kind of? Well, it's crack I didn't want to say crash landed. It landed. It landed and operated. It landed and, okay, so operated all, yes, to the, to the bitter end. Yeah. And I have a beautiful slide from the bitter end. So it is landed, you're right. It, it has landed. And actually here we have the, the lamp PI. Lamp is looking at, at the moon in ultraviolet, and actually that's the ultraviolet that is not from the sun, it's from throughout the solar system, line of radiation coming. So you could look into permanently shadowed craters. Permanently shadowed craters are prime targets where you would accumulate volatiles like ice. It should be bright. Many of these permanently shadowed craters came through dark. And of course, if you are into asteroids and you can refresh the surface every time something happens in the solar wind, maybe we have to rethink our classification for old surfaces and new surfaces, S types and the various types of asteroids. Here it is, when Alan said they landed. Here it is, the image. I think this is perhaps the, the one but last image. The bottom of the crater is incredibly smooth. And of course, Strange topography, this is the last image. And you are wondering who raked the soil? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> the picture was not fully transparent. The spacecraft actually reached the surface. We had no time. So the ray comes off, the data comes back to rasterize. So the cross parts, the, the bottom of the picture, never did. But it is smooth. It's an incredibly smooth, fine, fine surface. So many of these issues, actually, might be addressed in an upcoming mission. It's called LALI, Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. Alan put it in, in, in the pipeline. It was at NASA. The instrument suite is a neutral mass spectrometer, an ultraviolet emitter, and a dust detector that was here at the University of Colorado in Laos. And I would like to tell you a couple of words how the dust detector might or might not resolve some of these issues. Have. That's the flight model, that's how it looks. It's a beautiful little baby, a big. And we have an engineering model, and if you are takers, if you are on your way to the surface or at other destination, the engineering model could be updated and make it fly vertical. But certainly that's the baby that is actually completed. And we will look for a lot of things, including including secondary ejecta. Some of these plasma effects, whether we're going to see them or not, is risky. It's, it's certainly something that we could look for, and I'll show you the slides. But I bet half of my salary, at least, not my kids, that you will see <laughs> that you will see the secondary ejecta. Incoming high-speed, high-velocity meteorite will kick dust off the surface. I know this for sure at the ISIS satellites of Jupiter. We have made this measurement on board Galileo. It had a dust detector. It worked remarkably well. We have beautiful models. As it stands, I know much more about ejector production at Jupiter than at Moon. We actually have never done that measurement around the Moon. I do know how it works at Europa, Galileo, Listo. I don't know how it works at Moon. But we do have models, and we try to adopt those models for the lunar so LALI will be in orbit. Imagine that a micrometeorite would hit, lots of those coming, 50 ton per stuff is coming to the Earth every day. It will create a secondary particle and we will intercept it and will measure these single impacts of particles that are coming off the surface if they are beginning. These plasma issues, the rolling cloud, if they are at sunrise and sunset, they must be tiny, like 10 nanometer, maybe so. I cannot detect one impact at a time because I will show you in a slide how my instrument works. But there's a lot of them I can detect their collective contribution to the signal I'm measuring. And this is a plot six minutes out from reaching the local terminator. I'm coming from the dark side to the, to the day side. And in addition to the ejector particles that are always there, I will notice something that my noise level is changing as I approach the terminator. That is actually easier said than done because so is the UV radiation getting into your instrument. So I have to make sure that what I'm reporting is due to dust, not to sun shining into the device. So the instrument we built is clever enough. One second of the 10, we can make it blind to dust. I cannot make it blind to UV, I'll show you what it is. But we can make it blind to dust and we can measure the contribution from everything else but dust. This is how the device is tested at the University of Colorado Dust Accelerator. I will be going to walk over and I'll show you. It's a unique device. At this point, I think it's a world champion as far as shooting high speed dust particles. That's where actually Aldex was tested and calibrated. That's the device. Imagine a dust particle comes in. The speeds are, on average, will be around 1.6 kilometers per second. It's fast enough to make a little plasma puff up on impact. We set up an electric field. We recollect all the electrons into the target. We speed up the ions towards a, a multi-channel plate that is sensitive to ion impacts. And we have these two signals. We can actually reverse this electric field. And then we are blind to dust particles. We cannot detect dust. But the UV will still shine. And the UV shines into the multi-channel plate. It doesn't know. It doesn't know that it's really UV or real. What it is? What we're going to measure? The effect. Here is the signal. A 
elements. Of course, at the dust accelerator, we have huge charges. You see the image charge which approaches the target, the, the dust particle. There is a lot of charges, much bigger than in nature. And that's the signal that the electrons produce on the target. That's the signal the ions produce when they fly towards the channel plate. So we can look for coincidences, and we know how to turn the magnitude of the signal into the mass and speed of the dust particle. This is what we call a calibration or test. It's a function of speed at the accelerator and the radius of the particles. These are the, the things that we detected. And the first time we drew this picture, we almost got a heart attack. It turned out that all the black lines and the red lines were coming down the pipes of the accelerator, but we missed a bunch of them. The red lines were not, the red dots were not seen by others. It turns out that we only actually captured about 66% or so of all the incoming dust. That was not a happy day for a while. So what is going on? And then somebody remembered, hang on for a second. To keep out solar wind plasma electrons, we have three grids up front. We are grounded to the spacecraft, that's one grid. Okay, there is the minus 300 volt electric grid to keep out the electrons. And there is the, the grounds to, this, to, the, to the instrument itself three grids, each of them has a transparency of 90%. And as I mentioned, we have a duty cycle of 90%. 0.9 to the power of 4. That's why. That's why we are only detecting 65% of the incoming. And that is good. That is fine. We just have to remember to make the corrections once in space. And that leads me to possible other devices that you might like to fly one day around. In addition to mass, the size distribution, the spatial distribution, you could ask other questions. You could ask, for example, what are you made out of? What is your composition? And there are devices like that. Imagine that we're going to set up, dust particle comes in, it's a target, it will create electrons and ions. They are typically have a few electron volt worth of energy. We set up a huge electric field right in front of it, maybe a kilovolts. All ions are rushing forward. Roughly, they have all the same energy. They all went through the same electric field. The initial little energy distribution is overwhelmed by the electric field that we set. They all have the same energy, and then they go into a region where there is no electric field. So there is a horse race. If everybody has the same one half mv squared, the fat guys will flow behind. The little guys run ahead. They all have the same kinetic energy. Your time of flight, how long it will take you to get across, depends on your mass. So your arrival time will tell me how big you are. That's a time of flight spectrometer. In the lab, I can make really big ones. And I can make, this is the setup, for example. The particle comes in. The red dot is a laser lighting system. That's the first, the reel that you see holds the grid that will accelerate the ions. And I just detect when an ion arrives. And I will have a time of flight spectrum. This is time since the impact. Oh my goodness, if you are in spectroscopy, 107 and 109 of silver, the isotope of silver, are easily recognized. You want to look for oxygen or carbon or whatever, we can make a device for you and you say, that's too big, I cannot fly a meter long path. We can actually fold the path and have an instrument that the dust particle comes in and then we set up an electric field structure that you turn back. And we have this device in the lab, once again, you could easily resolve all the isotopes and you could make humongous knowledge, learn knowledge, or learn the, 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 what you want to know about the composition of the dust body. I wish Alex was competed when this whole huge excitement about water run in permanently shadow regions would come. Because an instrument like this would really tell you if there is ice or not. And it doesn't care if it's covered up with a thin layer of dust. For example, the Cassini instrument, the Cosmic Dust Analyzer on board Cassini, made this tremendous discovery of the plumes of Enceladus, and actually also made measurements of the eerie particles that are ice. If a chunk of ice hits my dust detector, it will break into tiny smithereens of water molecules of various sizes. Ice particles break apart into various sizes of molecules. A protohydrate, one proton and the water, Plus 18, plus 18, plus 18, plus 18. This forest of lines will pop up if you have ice. That's how ice shows up. 
And I know it's ice, because if it was only H2O, it would be only one line, 80. But if, the, if this forest of lines would emerge, I know that it was ice. So hopefully one day we're going to fly this, fly this around the moon. Certainly, I propose to fly it, it around Europa and learn about all kinds of things. People who are good at cosmochemistry look at the spectra and would say, in addition to ice, I see contamination from various salts. I tell you for sure there is a subsurface ocean. This is the device to look for a subsurface ocean or to look for ice in permanently shielded regions of anything, even if they are covered. So, I'm at the end of my talk. Maybe I'm not sure if it's a moral or something that I would like you to remember that our planetary science colleagues are well served with a bit of plasma physics. Certainly, the interpretation of imaging and spectral information has to know about the possibility of redistributing fine dust on surfaces of objects. And there is a way to do at least dust measurements or make these type of measurements to learn about where ice lives and certainly maybe even to look for subsurface oceans. The moon is a target. So is everything else in the solar system and there's plenty of them without an atmosphere, that these processes are at work. So we should do the right measurements, having the right tools. Thank you.